Well, hello and welcome to another Dev Nation. I'm excited today to be bringing you Clement. Clement is our reactive expert here at Red Hat, all things reactive and reactive programming. So I've certainly learned a lot from Clement over the years and I continue to learn. He is my mentor when it comes to reactive programming. That's how I like to think of it. And more importantly, he's going to show us reactive from the Quarkus perspective. You guys have been hearing a lot from Quarkus in our last several episodes. You're going to hear more about that today because it is awesome. So make sure you put your questions in the chat tab. And for all those people who can't see and can't hear and even see me right now, refresh your browser. Just remember that. Tell everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much. Come on. We'll turn it over to you. All right. Let me share my screen real quick. There we go. So uh, my name is Clément Escoffier. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. And in this presentation, we are going to see how we can build reactive application with Quarkus. So Quarkus is, uh, Quarkus is a full stack for Java that has been tailored for the cloud native environment. So that means that we are packaging more in terms of memory consumption and to start very, very uh, fast, to be very fast to start. The stack itself, uh, propose everything you need to build microservices uh, and even to write function and to execute them in a serverless environment. So Quarkus provides several benefits. First, it provides a very nice developer flow with a very fast hot reload. Uh, you are never interrupted. You can modify your configuration, run your test, having the hot reload all at the same time. It's pretty, uh, your velocity is going to hit the sky. As I said, supersonic subatomic Java. Super fast to start, very small memory consumption, and it's Java. It's also based on a lot of uh, libraries that you are used to have, uh, like Vertex or Hibernate or a CDI, and it's all there already to be used. And finally, um, it's what we are going to see today, how uh, Quarkus unifies imperative and reactive in a single stack. So, but what does reactive means? And reactive is actually a very overloaded word. It started with a reactive manifesto that has been defined by TypeSafe, no light band a few years back that define reactive systems. And reactive systems are distributed systems focusing on responsiveness. For this, all your components of your systems are going to exchange messages, and those messages uh, lead to asynchronous code because you don't know when you will receive these messages, and so you need to have a way to write code in an asynchronous manner. This is where reactive programming uh, takes place. There is several way to build asynchronous code. It go, can go from spreadsheets because yeah, spreadsheets are actually reactive programming. For example, you have a, a formula that is observing a cell inside your spreadsheet, and if you modify your cell, the formula is going to be updated. So that it's React. Another way to build uh, um, asynchronous code is to use events and event handlers like interruption or signals and stuff like that. It can be low level, you can use callbacks, there is many ways to build that. You can use actors too, or uh, something that is coming to Java in the next few years, let's say, is going to uh, uh, be fibers that will simplify all we write asynchronous code because we will be able to write it kind of a synchronous manner, but it's going to be ex executed asynchronously. Reactive programming, the pure reactive programming is based on the idea of uh, data flow and a pipe of data. So you have pipes and you have data inside and you will have publishers that will feed the pipes with data and consumers that will consume this data. As soon as you have this, you quickly have an issue if you have a slow uh, consumer and a fast provider. So for this, you, we need some kind of back pressure protocol. And this is where reactive streams come into the place as reactive streams define a non-blocking and asynchronous back pressure protocol. Be aware that reactive streams is very low level and does not provide any operators, and implementing the reactive streams types yourself is generally a very bad idea. Fortunately, there is several implementation of reactive streams that avoid you to do that, and two of them are part of the same family. It's what we call reactive extensions. 
Typically, we have Eric Java 2 and reactors, which are based on React streams and provide lots of operators, so you can actually compose your program using uh, these operators. Okay, but I didn't define what reactive means so far. And if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, reactive means showing a response to a stimulus. There is another definition of this, which is actually much more interesting for us. It means acting in response to a situation rather than creating or controlling it. This definition is exactly uh, where we see the difference between imperative and reactive. Because in the imperative war, or world, the, the one you, you generally use, well, you as a developer control what will be called next. Because what will be called next is a method you call, or the next line, and so on. In a reactive world, it depends on the messages or stimuli you are going to receive and you are going to send. So you are not really in control of the flow. Your environment is in control of the flow. Anyway, if we want to define, uh, uh, if we want to take this definition, we can say that reactive is kind of a synonym for event-driven, no? Because, well, an event-driven program is going to react to event failures uh, and messages, which are kind of our stimuli, and it's fine. But as soon as we have event-driven application, we need to think about concurrency, because potentially you are going to receive a lot of um, uh, messages in a very uh, short time window. So the first part of the reactive landscape is going to help you to build concurrent applications. Here we find right programming, right streams, and both are kind of based on this non-blocking and asynchronous idea. But we are in 2019, and these days we are not building standalone applications. We are building systems, we are building microservices, which are living in a world uh, that contains other microservices, other siblings. So we need to think about how the system is going to behave, not only how the individual components are, are going to handle requests. And it's where we can see how reactive systems fit in this picture. Reactive systems is an architectural style to build distributed systems with one focus, one objective, being responsive. Reactive systems is based on four pillars, and the first one is message-driven, which should be, actually be read asynchronous message passing. It means that all our components are going to exchange messages. This gives us two other characteristics, elasticity and resilience. As soon as you use messages, you are going to um, send messages to virtual addresses. Because of this, it's very easy to have elasticity. As when I send a message, I send it to this virtual address, and then I can have a queue or broker that will dispatch a load among a set of subscribers, and increase or decrease this number of subscribers depending on the depth of my, of my queue. So elasticity is kind of easy in that case. Resilience comes also from this virtual address ID because we can imagine sending the messages to one uh, component, but as soon as this component crash, having a second one that will uh, replace it. Okay, also, we can have acknowledgement in, on our messages, meaning that the function processing the message can acknowledge and, and indicate when the message has been processed correctly. If you are able to under messages, requests, and so on, when under fluctuating load and when facing failures, you are actually building a responsive system. A system that take care of, well, of answering those requests in a timely fashion and this responsiveness is very important today for our users because users hate when uh, we have uh, failing uh, systems. One very important part to understand is that asynchronous or reactive does not mean multi-threading. And when I say uh, asynchronous message passing, I don't mean taking um, a client um, that uses thread pools and queuing a request there and having these thread pools taking care of, of, of the business. No, that's actually a, is a very bad idea because your concurrency is going to be limited by the number of threads you have assigned to the thread pool. Most threads you have 
uh, more expensive is your solution for two reasons. First, each threads have a huge memory cost, and memory is not that cheap anymore on the cloud. And the second part is actually it also have a CPU cost because more threads you have, more time you are going to spend switching between your, these threads. This time of CPU is going to be taken from your quota. And taken from your quota is paying your cloud provider for nothing. So asynchronous and reactive is not about multithreading. It's about never blocking and so relying on non-blocking IO to do all those exchanges. OK, but right now, you probably have your microservices using HTTP. And we are going to see why it's not necessarily a good idea and how you can switch to messaging. So when we build microservices, the idea was that each microservice is independent and run in isolation, which means that it should be able to run even if the other microservices are not there. This actually fell short when we think about HTTP because if one of your service is not there, then the caller is going to fail, and the caller is going to fail, and so on, until you get uh, the user getting the error. So of course you say, yeah, but error should not um, cascade that way. And Netflix proposed or popularized a few years back circuit breakers. So we should use circuit breakers to protect this, to protect uh, the failures to be cascaded and to bubble up to the users. OK, all right, yes, yeah, circuit breaker fix part of the problem. However, tuning circuit breaker can be very, very hard. And most of the circuit breaker you use today are using thread pools, which lead to the uh, uh, previous slides about being non-blocking and not using thread pools. Also, circuit breakers can um, provide fallbacks. Well, fallbacks are nice, but sometimes they are not very useful. Imagine uh, you want to have the balance of your bank account, and because this microservice is not there, it's going to provide a fallback with a default value for your balance. That's not really useful. So um, how can you uh, provide different way to do this? And actually, it's very simple. Just use messages. And messaging is there for the last 25 years, more or less. Uh, so there is a um, uh, less risk to use such kind of solution in the sense that, well, it's there. We know how to tune it. We know how to use it. If you use messaging, you have a few benefits. First, all the messages are going to be sent in a non-blocking uh, manner. You can even have request reply. Because if you take protocols like MQP or RabbitMQ, they are supporting request reply very nicely. Elasticity, as I said, can be provided by the same middleware by scaling up and down the number of subscribers. And finally, the resilience can be done also the same way using acknowledgement or having a shadow microservices that will take over when the first one crashes. Messaging also allow other patterns that are very important today. So I already mentioned request reply, but imagine things like message stream or event sourcing and CQRS. They are based on, on messages and the ability for your microservices to consume, well, a sequence of message, a stream of message and well, react to it for each message or doing some composition of these streams. It's also enable publish subscribe, which is very useful these days if you need to inform one microservice that something happened in an event driven manner. Like every time a user logged in or logged out, you want to send an event that, that, uh, in order to make other microservices aware of this event. You could with, with HTTP, but that will require that the sender knows who is interested by this event, which actually is going to break the, um, um, the loose coupling. Um, so let's speak about Quarkus now. Quarkus provide a solution that is HTTP, messaging, and streaming all in one. So you don't have to choose. You can really mix uh, all of them. And that's what we have behind the idea of unifying reactive and imperative. So typically, you will have a synchronous HTTP at some point, generally at the um, 
um, the gates of your system. And in Quarkus, it's going to be completely non-blocking and asynchronous. Right now, it's based on the Undertow, and we want to switch to Netty, and it's a work in progress. Once you get your request, Quarkus is going to call your application code, which is going to use generally REST, um, JAXRS and CDI, and this code can emit messages. These messages will be sent to a messaging middleware, whatever it is, and on the other side, you can have another Quarkus application that will receive those messages and do some processing on top of that. So let's demonstrate this. Imagine a coffee shop, a traditional coffee shop. You go to the counter, you order a coffee, and then you have the, well, the waiters or the barista that is there, that is get your money and go to the coffee machine, do your coffee and bring that to you. Meaning that during that time, all those other customers have queued and will be served once I get my coffee. This is typically the HTTP world, completely blocking. I wait to get my coffee. Now, think about another type of coffee shop, more in the line of Starbucks or Nero or, or Costa coffee. In these coffee shops, you go to the counter, you order, you pay, then we give you a receipt with, uh, and so on, with, with your, an ID and so to justify that you pay. And as I said, tell you that your beverage is going to be ready, uh, but later. This is typically how we will do it in an asynchronous manner. And we are going to build this. So our coffee shop set microservices represents a counter. And when you place an order, and you are going to be to get a response, but just with the order ID. The order is going to be enqueued into a Kafka queue, which is orders, and and then um, you will have um, uh, another queue, another topic that is named queue actually, uh, that will tell you about the state of your orders, if it's prepared or if it's ready, and so on. The orders topics is read by baristas that will prepare your coffee and then send uh, that to the queue topics. And so you can get, you can retrieve your, your, uh, your coffee. So the first things we want to build when we switch from this HTTP world to this Kafka world is uh, switch to asynchronous HTTP. So the first things in the old world will get a, uh, endpoint like order that will get an order and I will use an HTTP client to call my uh, coffee machine and barista to have this order and this return a beverage and I return that to my uh, to my customer in a blocking manner. If we switch to asynchronous, instead of returning a beverage directly, I'm going to return a future beverage, what we call in Java a completion stage. Of course, this means that the processing must be asynchronous and this means that we are going to use an HTTP client, a true HTTP client, not an HTTP client um, uh, using uh, a thread pool, but really a non-blocking HTTP client, which would pass this order in an asynchronous manner. The fact that it's non-blocking is very important here because that means that we don't have thread pool and we don't limit our concurrency based on the number of threads we, our clients can handle. Okay, but we're still waiting here. Uh, well, at least the customer is still waiting, so we're still not where we want. And you're right. So we need to, to improve a little bit our solution. The first thing we will do is to uh, return to the, uh, uh, to the user the order ID, so like the receipt. So if we call this method, um, um, this endpoint, the check service endpoint, we pass an order, Immediately, the counter is going to enqueue this order to uh, to the baristas and immediately give the uh, computed uh, uh, order ID. So we return immediately. The second uh, part uh, is about sending messages because so far I didn't send messages. To do this, we are going to use microprofile re reactive messaging and. Uh, in our implementation, we have something called emitters, which will bridge the imperative world and the reactive world. So typically, I can use, I can inject an emitter like this with at inject and at stream. Um, and this emitter, when I call the send method on them, is going to emit messages 
to a channel named orders. And by configuration, we can say that these channels is actually a Kafka topic. Actually, this Kafka topic doesn't have to be named orders. It can be named as you want. And maybe you also have strong or weird conventions around uh, your queues and topics uh, naming. Like I, I've seen uh, one deployment where all the queues were named after a lot of the ring characters. But in your code, having a, a channels or topics named Gandalf doesn't really mean anything. So anyway, uh, here we have our NQ method that will just send messages to this channel. And this will go, we will see, uh, on Kafka. All right, but this was my uh, coffee shop microservice. So representing my counter, we need to have um, uh, our completion stage, uh, uh, our barista microservice. Our barista microservice is receiving from the orders queue, orders topic, and is writing to the queue topic. So orders and queue are actually channels in this case. We don't know, we don't care if they are topic queue or their behavior. So this is actually how a barista is implemented. It has two annotation, incoming and outgoing. Incoming indicates that I'm reading from this channel and ongoing indicates that I'm writing to this channel. And here, this method prepare is called for every message that has been sent on the order channel and is doing some asynchronous processing on it because preparing some coffee takes some time. So, uh, here, well, the code that we are going to show is actually taking some time to prepare coffee to re actually represent how it works. The signature we, we use here, which uh, is for each import I'm returning the completion stage, is one among more than 30 of them. So we propose many, many ways to produce, process, and consume data. Some are um, pair message based, so you receive a single message and you return what you want, some are asynchronous, and some allow uh, to manipulate the streams directly so you can have a stream-based operation like windowing and so on. The last part of our demo is how we will display that the uh, drinks are ready. And for this, we are using the stream uh, annotation again. Uh, it's a qualifier. And I'm going to read the channel beverages. And by reading the channel beverages, it means that I'm getting a stream. And in that case, I've decided to use the right streams publisher types. Because behind all the streams operation and message operation, it's actually right streams, but you don't have to manipulate it. Uh, here, I've um, on purpose uh, decided to show that to you, but you can use Eric Java 2 flavor or you can use uh, right streams operator. So you have many different ways to inject your streams. And to display the products, the, well, the beverages that have been ready, I'm going to return this stream directly as a, a server sent event. OK, so let's have a look at this demo. So I have my coffee shop running here. I have uh, my uh, Kafka broker running, because I'm going to use uh, Kafka. I will go to my Swagger UI, because um, um, Quarkus provide a very nice Swagger UI so based on Open, uh, Open API, and I'm going to order some espresso. And because it's really uh, Starbucks, it's a, it's a actually never were able to write my name correctly. So and so on. So I called it, and I get my espresso Clemens. This is my order ID, and if it goes there, this is the last one. And what we have here, it means that. First, the coffee shop has enqueued the order in the queue topic, and we display it as enqueue. And when the barista took the order and prepared it, it sent another message to uh, the queue, to, to, yeah, to the queue topic, and we will get it. So let me redo it from a second window so you can really see how it works. And this time I'm going to change. I'm going to send an espresso to Burr. And actually, if Burr comes to France and says that it's called Burr, it's probably going to be written like that, uh, which actually means butter, but uh, it's how we will pronounce it. Um, I'm sending it, and see, we immediately have the order in the queue, 
And once Julie, so our barista, has prepared the, the, the espresso, he can get it uh, and it's ready to be uh, drank. We will quit this. Okay. Uh, so, okay, but how does that work when I have a lot of uh, uh, um, coffee order? So, I can order a lot of coffee. We'll see that here. So, and one of the main differences with HTTP is that all the orders are going to be enqueued and one by one processed. So it's not really a synchronous request reply where the first will be served first and then the second one and then the third one and so on. Here we enqueue everything and well, it will be delivered when it will be delivered. Okay, so nice. We have seen how it works. So we, we place an order. This order goes to two, uh, uh, two other order topics. Then we, we also indicate that it's in queue. The barista read it, prepare it, and send a message to the uh, queue topic with the ready state. Okay, but how can we demonstrate the reactive system benefits? Well, the first one is to stop the uh, baristas. Because typically a barista can take a break or whatever. And if I order coffee again, my orders are going to be put in my queue, but they will never pass ready because I don't have any barista that will uh, uh, prepare them. If I restart, Julie, there we go. Yeah. We start seeing that Julie is taking over and going to prepare all the pending requests. Another thing we can do is to have a second barista that I named Tom. And as soon as Tom is ready, yeah, I can enqueue lots of coffee. And we will see that Tom and Julie are going to dispatch the load. So again, this shows the elasticity. So we show the durability so and resilience, meaning that if a service is not there, no problem, we don't lose the, the request, so we can process them once somebody is ready to serve them. And the second part is uh, elasticity by just starting another subscriber. Obviously, in our system, this will be uh, managed by auto scaling. So let's back to the slide and conclude. So we have seen the resilience part, we have seen the elasticity part. So what we built was really reactive systems. So reactive systems is really a new way to build uh, distributed systems that really focus on responsiveness, don't lose your state and so on. So it has elasticity, resilience, and non-blocking message passing as primitives. Quarkus gives you everything you need to build reactive systems. And to do that, it unifies imperative and reactive. It does not only let you build reactive systems, it gives you a way to do that in a very simple manner where in your code, you just have a few new annotations like incoming, ongoing, and so on, that will give a very a development model very similar to what you are used to have. So with this, you can build CRUD, REST, and CLI using the imperative model, a uh, reactive system and data streaming application using the reactive model and mix both uh, inside your same application on the same system. I think we are already almost out of time. So if you have any question, I will take some right now. And if you are more interested by this, you can check out the Quarkus.io website or uh, chat with the team on Zulip. And of course, uh, follow us on, on Twitter. So... <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Better now. All right. So a couple of questions. Okay. One is the demo code. You got a GitHub URL for the demo code? So I don't have Uber, so that's going to be interesting. <laughs> oh. Um, it does seem like, here, let me try this. Ah, that was working. No. Okay, I can take a few questions uh, question based on uh, on their priority. I think that we have a, a few uh, mid. 
Uh, is the source code of the, uh, from the demo available? Yes, it is available. It's on my GitHub repository. Uh, uh, so my, my GitHub nickname is CS Coffier. And you will find a Quarkus reactive demo, and you have exactly everything, and you have the instruction to redo the, the full demo. Uh, Are servlet filter capable of non-blocking request header updates? So we have servlet um, support. Um, I don't know about the non-blocking request header updates. Um, I would say yes. I don't see why we could not do it. So I believe we can, but need to be checked. Um, yeah, so is there a Git repo for the demo? Yes. Uh, so just check my uh, GitHub account. Uh, is Quarkus to make full reactive application? Can we use Enrich Java or Reactor? So we support uh, Enrich Java 2 and a micro profile reactive streams operator, which is very. Everything I did here, you can you can use Enrich Java 2. It's uh, it's it's. Can create flowable. Uh, your emitter can be a flowable too, so if you know Java 2, you will be uh, fine. Uh, also, in a Jack service endpoint, we have seen that we return in um, a completion stage. Uh, we can also return a single or um, may I don't know about maybe, but I believe it's supported too. <laughs> um, yeah. So come on. Can we maybe. integrate? Uh, yep. Yeah, so I'm not sure if anyone can hear me, but the prep, we should just take one more question and then we're out of time. And that's the WebSphere MQ question, I think is a good one. Yes. So can we integrate uh, with uh, WebSphere MQ uh, uh, and, and as yeah. well as using GMS? So WebSphere MQ, yes, um, you, you can. So we have several connectors for, uh, for our messaging, we support MQP. Uh, RabbitMQ, Kafka, and a few others. It works with uh, WebSphereMQ. Uh, for GMS, uh, we are working on it. The issue with GMS is, is transactions, but uh, we start having a plan. So um, as we have a plan, it's going to work very, very soon. OK. Well, I do think we are we have run over our time slot for today. I'm actually looking up the GitHub repo link for a reactive messaging demo is the one you said, right? Uh, no, it's another one. Uh, I, I can send that to you. It's uh, it's probably called reactive demo. Okay, don't see that one, but all right. We have reactive messaging demo, but not reactive demo. <laughs> and the coffee shop demo. Too many repositories. Too many repositories. Thinks he found one. Oh no, Quackus coffee oh, shop demo. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> great. All right. Well, then we need to get out of here. The uh, But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for attending and the questions. And come on, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye.